My name's Nathan Richards. I'm the program head for the Maritime Heritage Program here at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. I'm also an associate professor in the program in Maritime Studies at East Carolina University. And I'd like to welcome you to the Science on the Sound series, which is a monthly series at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. We, uh, we talk about a whole range of different topics uh, across all the different programs that are here at, at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. Um, I'm going to introduce Mr. Converse's talk a little bit. Um, Mr. Converse uh, has, is writing a book on tonight's subject. Uh, he's previously had a career with the US Marine Corps, and he was also a technical manual writer for BAE Systems in Chesapeake. Um, he and I have known each other for a few years, mm -hmm. um, and we've been sort of intersected over different maritime subjects. But recently, actually right now, we're in the third week of a field school with the program Maritime Studies at ECU, and we're uh, excavating a shipwreck we're uh, recording and excavating a shipwreck in Rodanthe, and we think that it might have a connection to the Barber Boatworks. And the Barber Boatworks is one of the four um, top shipyards involved in this World War II uh, building program that, uh, that we'll be, you'll be hearing about tonight. So I'm gonna hand it across to, uh, to George, and uh, we'll take questions uh, after the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this program started out with a discussion with a former uh, uh, curator at uh, the Museum of the Admiral, Tom Butchko, and we started looking around in Elizabeth City to see, trying to find out what the old shipyard did during the war. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and we found out at the end that there was an awful lot of boat building being done here in North Carolina during the war. Uh, there was a definite requirement for wooden vessels. Uh, all the steel, all the aluminum was needed for the major warships. Uh, they built everything, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, amphibious landing ships. The Liberty ships and the Victory cargo ships and troop transports and oil tankers built down in uh, Wilmington uh, used up all the steel around here. So there was a major, major requirement for something other than steel. Uh, Besides that, all the major shipyards in the country were tasked to capacity. They were building anything. And when they ran out of, uh, of uh, shipyards, the government turned to places like the Missouri Valley Bridge and Iron Works Company on the Ohio River. <clears throat> and they, had, before the war, built steel bridges. But one of their redeeming qualities was they could weld. So a Navy lieutenant would show up with a set of plans and say, start building me LSTs. And they would start turning those things out, and at the height of the war, uh, that bridge company was building one LST per month. Uh, so when they ran out of those type uh, uh, places, then they started creating their own shipyards. So the Newport News um, Shipbuilding Company came down to Wilmington and opened up the uh, uh, North Carolina uh, Shipbuilding Corporation and they started building uh, Liberty ships, and then they started shifted over to uh, Victory ships. And they built 234 of those uh, vessels during the war. But wood was cheaper to build, it was faster to build, and it was available. Uh, a lot of these ships went over to uh, France, they went over to uh, England, they went over to Austria, they went over to Russia underneath the Lend-Lease program. So they needed to get more and more ships into the, into the system. North Carolina had a great tradition of building wooden boats, all the way back for log canoes, going back to the Indians, uh, the Perry Auger. Uh, there was a lot of small boat yards along all the rivers and all the banks of the sounds. Uh, George Washington Creef was one of the major ones in this area, and he built uh, his boat yard. Whoops, wrong one there. His boat yard up here was pretty small, uh, and he shifted that to Manio and teamed up with Davis, and then they started creating small boats, mostly uh, power boats in, uh, in Manio. But there were a lot of other boats, skiffs, shad boats built everywhere along the coastline, uh, fishing boats, schooners, ferries. During the Civil War, they built ironclads on the rivers and sounds of the area, and eventually steamers, uh, which ran through up and down the rivers and out to the Outer Banks, taking the holiday tourists out there. 
You don't want to be quick on this. <laughs> All right, during the war, prior to the war, there was very few boatyards in operation. In fact, there were only two boatyards that did any type of commercial work. The Elizabeth City Shipyard and the Barber Boat Works in New Bern. There was a minor boatyard, the Bell Wallace Company in Moorhead City, and he would do in a lot of uh, boat, small boats, skiffs, uh, uh, small tugs, things of that nature. And, uh, and like Creef uh, in Manio, he did a lot of small powerboat racing. But there wasn't much that could do and, and suddenly get going to start building uh, warships for the Navy. So therefore, they established two different major boat yards. The Manio Boat Building Corporation grew out of the Creef and Davis Boat Works, and uh, the Pamlico Shipyard was not in existence before the war, and people from the Elizabeth City Shipyard in Elizabeth City went down to Washington and opened up a boat yard or shipyard on the banks of the river down there and started creating oil tank barges. The Elizabeth City Shipyard was the largest of these and turned out the most boats but not the biggest of the boats. Uh, it started out as, as 1919 as a Marine Division of the Elizabeth City Ironworks and Supply Company. And during World War II, they built uh, 10 of the Coast Guard rescue boats. Get that going there. They built submarine chasers for the Navy, up to 30 of them. Nine of these ended up going to the Soviet Union. Uh, they built four of the large harbor tugs. And... Uh, six of the quick supply boats for the Army, which were the same size, and essentially the, uh, uh, like the submarine chasers, except they were used for different purposes. <clears throat> the Elizabeth City Shipyard was located on a uh, position right about here, and this had been an established position for many boat yards since long before the Civil War. And once the, the city was established, they started building boats on that point of land because the Charles Creek came down here and the river came around here and this was a very deep portion of the river. And so you could build and launch just about anything you needed. Prior to the war, it was a relatively small shipyard. Employed about 50 people. And they did a lot of work in uh, doing barges. They did a lot of work in repairing the uh, uh, steamers, the oil tank, small oil tankers that plied the area. Uh, a lot of fishing boats that came in there to do work. And uh, <clears throat> during the 30s, uh, even though there was a depression on, there were a lot of people, the rich people, brought their boats down here. And they would sail them down to Florida from New York. And they would stop here in Elizabeth City and get their boats overhauled at the shipyard. <clears throat> but by 1942, the shipyard had expanded from this position right down here all the way down the river and put in all these piers. And, and this area was right here was covered with buildings. And um, so they've all been taken down after the war. But that's where they built the uh, submarine chasers. Submarine chasers were 110 foot long. They only had about a six-foot draft. They were about 17 feet uh, wide, and they were heavily armed for a boat that small. They had depth charges. They had forward-firing depth charges. They had 40-millimeter guns. They had 20-millimeter guns. Uh, they had uh, uh, sonar. Uh, they had uh, smoke generators. Uh, they had uh, uh, hydrophones. Uh, they were a very uh, sophisticated boat at that time by the end of the war. And you can see here as we go through the various stages of building the boats, they were all constructed of the wood. The wood came from everywhere. It came from around the local area, but they also went out as far as Washington, the state of Washington, to get wood from out there, bring it in here. The boats were made of southern pine, white pine, Douglas fir. Uh, some had teak parts, some had oak parts on them. So they used all kinds of different types of wood. By the time the last uh, submarine chaser was built, the shipyard had grown from 50 people up to 600 people. 
So, I mean, this was a major operation, and <clears throat> it was kind of restricted. Uh, you could get a job there, and you could be uh, exempt from a lot of the uh, service work because you had a major construction going on for the services. <clears throat> they were uh, twin engines. Uh, they had uh, gasoline-powered engines. And you can see here that uh, that's pretty, oops, pretty much what they look like after they came off the ways. Here's two that were just been launched. One undergoing painting. The um, cockpit or the pilot house was initially made out of wood, but they find out they could, as, as the aluminum came along, they could make it aluminum easier, so they would just ship in the whole pilot house, put it on the boat. <clears throat> they did that with the guns. The guns were brought in. The communications gear was brought in. Uh, all, the, all the weapons and everything were brought in so that uh, by the time it, the ship was finished, it was ready to be taken over by the Navy. And the Navy would then commission the boat down here. And you see some commissioning ceremonies. And these were uh, launchers for the forward firing uh, depth charges. They called them mouse traps. Uh, this was a 40 millimeter gun. But initially, when the war came, they used whatever guns they had. And so a lot of these boats were, were sent out with uh, guns from uh, World War I. During World War I, they built 40, about 450 submarine chasers, not here in Elizabeth City, but around the country. And these were just about the same size, same capability. So the Navy very quickly went to a similar type boat, except they added on all modern weapons. But initially, they put on three-inch guns and uh, uh, 50 caliber machine guns, whatever they had to get the boat ready to go. The boat would sail up to uh, Norfolk, up through the inland waterway, and generally be guided up there by uh, pilots from the Elizabeth City shipyard, and they would then be turned over to the Navy for trials and acceptance testing up in uh, Chesapeake Bay. They built 450 of these during the Second World War. Elizabeth, there were 47 shipyards that were turning these vessels out. Elizabeth City was one of three yards that turned out 30 of them during that time period. They built four of the large harbor tugs. Harbor tugs have three different sizes. These were the most powerful. They had uh, 800 uh, horsepower and uh, could really do uh, a good job moving around aircraft carrier. Uh, the tugs here in Elizabeth City didn't see any action because they were never attacked because they were, they were serviced in uh, Charleston and uh, Norfolk. But following the war in 1950, when the battleship USS Missouri ran aground and was aground up in Chesapeake Bay for two weeks, it took every uh, salvage vessel, every tug, every uh, beachmaster group, two weeks, all on the East Coast to come here and, and get her to pull her off. So the two from Elizabeth City were heavily involved in pulling Missouri off. The second major boat uh, building company was the Barber Boat Works in New Bern. It was established in 1932, and primarily it also built, uh, uh, worked on government vessels, it worked on steamers, it worked on uh, mostly fishing boats that would come up the river, get service, then go back out to sea to Moorhead. Uh, they built different types of boats. They built larger boats. They built minesweepers for the Royal Navy as part of the lend -Lease program. They built salvage and rescue ships uh, for the Royal Navy and they built net tenders for the U.S. and Royal Navies. Uh, the minesweepers were made out of wood and were 136 feet long. The uh, salvage ships were 183 feet long, and the net tenders were 194 feet long. So these were big boats. They could not get them downriver. Before the Barber Boat Works could get the contract, they had to certify to the Navy that they could get them down river. So they had to bring in uh, dredges, and they dredged around the, um, uh, the Trent River. <clears throat>
right about here. So they had to dredge this area, and this is not a very wide portion here. And then they had to dredge out to the noose and then down, all the way down to Moorhead City to make sure they had a 12-foot depth uh, so these boats could did, get down river. And they eventually got it all dredged to 13 feet. But by the time these larger vessels started heading down river, they were chewing up mud all the way down there. But they all made, they all made it down there. This is a picture in, in 1953, uh, and it had been cleaned up quite a bit. But at the start of the war, they had two marine railways, but during the war, they increased that to four. And you can see here that the boats they were building uh, were really quite large. They would build two at a time initially, and then they had four on the ways uh, later on during the war of different sizes. This is one of the salvage ships here, and they were single screwed. Let's see. And this one's just about getting ready to launch. This is one of the minesweepers. And at the bottom picture is a salvage ship and a net tender undergoing, they've just been launched and now they're being fitted out. The Manual Boat Building Corporation uh, was pretty much non-existent except for the small David uh, boat yard. You can see here that it was basically just a one lane marine railway and it had this building here and it had a shed right here. And that was the boat yard. By the time the war ended, it had expanded it had two railways, and then it went all the way back up here into Manio. And they would build the boats in here, shift them out, launch them going down there. They started out trying to get work for Manio, and also any place on the Outer Banks. There was, all the men were pretty much gone. They were off to war. All the fishing fleets were gone. Almost every fishing boat that was a trawler type vessel was taken over by the Navy. They commissioned the CO or the owner of the boat and his crew, put them in the Navy and made them mine sweepers because they knew how to tow uh, <clears throat> trawler nets and things of that nature. Uh, so they were, the boats were gone, the young men were gone, and there wasn't any work for anybody to do. So a group of uh, 10 of the citizens and mostly the major businessmen in the city went up to Washington and got the government to give them a contract for sailing dinghies. And they could build these 14-foot uh, sailing dinghies and they got a contract to build 20 of them for the U.S. Naval Academy to teach midshipmen how to sail. From that, and they did such a good job on that, they started going out getting other contracts and they started building air-sea rescue boats for the Army Air Forces. And there were four different kinds built. Three of them at the times were built here in Manio, 104 foot air sea rescue boats, which was pretty much essentially the same thing as the submarine chasers, just a little bit smaller, but configured differently on the inside. They had 85 foot air sea rescue boats, and these are pretty much like the PT boats, and a lot of people confuse them with PT boats during the war. Uh, but they were, uh, they were very fast. And uh, depending on how close these boats were needed to an air base and how close the air base was to the water, depended on what type of boat you got. Uh, there were some smaller 45-foot ones, and these were used in lakes uh, around the country where the, the air bases uh, were near water in case a plane went down and awake, the water was relatively calm. Uh, the 83- and 85-foot ones were pretty much on the coast and didn't go up far out to sea. The 104 foot ones were sent over to the Pacific and these were used inner island uh, uh, basically as uh, watch stations for the B-52s or the B-29s flying up to Japan in case they went down all throughout the, uh, the uh, west, western portion of the Pacific. They also built army launches 
And these were uh, landing craft, and uh, essentially they were called Higgins boats. They were designed by Higgins in North Carolina, and they were used for a wide variety of purposes. Initially, this, this uh, design was the landing craft used in the early invasions. Later on, they added a bow ramp that could be dropped down, and then later on, they had a third version that had a big bow ramp, and you could put a, a Jeep and loft load Jeep. So that's generally when you hear the term Higgins boat, you'll either refer to a landing craft with a bow ramp, or in a lot of cases, it'll be to the PT boats, because Higgins designed the PT boats down in New Orleans, and there were two different sizes of PT boats, uh, one built by uh, Elko and one built by uh, uh, the Higgins people. The uh, Manio and the, and the hardware and uh, lumber company there started building uh, rafts for all these ships that the Navy was putting out. They needed life rafts. And so they built 200 balsa wood life floats. They call them life floats. But it was essentially a life raft. And they were put on troop ships and they were put on naval vessels and uh, all throughout the, uh, the Navy. The dinghies were a, a it's called international 14-foot class. It's kind of like the moth boats that we have around here, a little bit larger, but this was a sailing class. And they used them to train the midshipmen how to read the wind and how to read the water and how to uh, see how the wind and the water affect your boat. The Air Force rescue boats, this was the 45-foot version, the 85-foot, 83-foot version, and then the 104-foot version. It didn't, the way they got down, they had to climb down the nets in World War II into the landing craft, and then the landing craft would then circle around the uh, attack transport and then line up and then fan out to make their beach landing. <clears throat> uh, these were tough boats. Uh, this was a demonstration down in uh, New Orleans to show how the boat could run into a seawall and not be damaged. And uh, so they were, they were tough. <clears throat> Pamlico Shipyard was a spinoff from Elizabeth City Shipyard. Uh, they were running out of work for the Navy. The war was ending. They needed to start looking around for other customers, so they went to the Army and said, we can build uh, oil tank barges, because the Army had a need for that. Uh, the Navy did not like it. They said, yeah, you can't go work for the Army, you're building our boats. And if you go build uh, for the Army, uh, you're not getting any more contracts from us. So what they, um, the Elizabeth City Shipyard did was they sold it to the Gahagan Construction Company. And they knew they had they had run a shipyard up in New York, but down here they were the dredging people, and they would go around and dredge all the rivers and sounds around here. So they sent six people down here and said, "All right, we now own this company." But the same people from Elizabeth City Shipyard and the same management went down to Washington, North Carolina, got on the river down there, and uh, uh, created the Pamlico Shipyard on the riverbank. <clears throat> uh, Organization called the Defense Plant Corporation uh, funded it uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers, and they built 30 oil tank barges. And these were supposed to be used on the rivers and inland waterways to carry gasoline uh, and petroleum products. Uh, these were bulk carriers. Uh, this was a disaster. Uh, but during the war, you did what you had to do. And so the wooden tank barges uh, were very, very dangerous. And they were easy to split. And if you ran in two barges into each other or you ran a barge into a uh, lock, uh, it would tend to split, spill the gasoline all over the place, and it was very terrible fire hazard. So most of these type barges sat out the war. Uh, some were converted in carrying dry cargo, but they were not much used for carrying gasoline. The uh, Shipyard was down here. Now they just went down and cleared an area of land which had been a uh, gypsum plant and was cleared and flat. So they just moved in there and started building. Uh, 
again, they started out with nothing, and uh, by the uh, end of the uh, war, they were up to 1,200 workers at, the, at this shipyard. And they would put in, start out building the launching ramp, and then start building the building ways, and they would slide the, the barges onto the launching ramp and launch it. They had no buildings, they had to put in the buildings. And build the barge, and then it eventually slide it in on the launching ramp. Workers came from all over eastern North Carolina to work here. They had a tough time housing them. Uh, they put people up in people's homes. Uh, but the, uh, the town of Washington uh, was very, very helpful and said, come on down, we'll, we'll make it work. You can see just this one's just getting ready to launch. There's one under construction here, and this one's just about ready to be launched as well. They would launch them into the river, stage them there, and then the Army would bring up the Army tugs and tow them to wherever they were going to be used. <clears throat> The submarine chasers probably saw more action than anybody except the minesweepers. Uh, they did all kinds of work throughout all theaters of operations. And the, mines, uh, the submarine chasers built in Elizabeth City went everywhere. They did air defense for operations. They did escorts across the Pacific and across the Atlantic. Uh, they went into the Mediterranean, transited uh, ships um, to Africa and up to northern Russia, and that was pretty tough going in the North Atlantic, a 110-foot boat uh, in the wintertime. Uh, all of the amphibious landings in Italy, southern France, and Normandy, and most of the landings in the Pacific had submarine chasers involved in them. And these were the guide boats for the landing craft. And they would lead the landing craft onto the beaches, and they would be used as communication vessels, and they'd be used as air defense for the uh, landings. Uh, in the Adriatic, in Yugoslavia, they would land, they landed uh, commandos into the Balkans uh, for both the British and the uh, uh, Yugoslavs. Uh, they would stationed in the Adriatic for drown, uh, act as uh, air sea rescue boats for the, for the bombers going into Ploesti oil fields in Romania. And so in case a bomber crashed in the uh, Adriatic, they'd, they'd pick them up there. Um, and they supported the Soviet operations in the North uh, Bering Sea, the White Seas. Uh, they were not very efficient by themselves. A submarine chaser would contact a U-boat. The U-boat, they'd get in front of it. The U-boat would be heading this way. And they would cross its bow and lay a pattern off the stern of depth charges and hope they got it. Uh, they also had uh, forward-firing um, rockets, um, depth charge rockets. The problem with these things, they had to actually hit the, uh, the submarine. If they missed the submarine, they just went and exploded on the bottom and weren't very effective. So by itself, the subchaser wasn't very effective. And I don't think there's a recorded instance where one subchaser was able to sink a submarine. So what they would do, they would use them in uh, uh, multiple uh, vessel attack, and they try and get three of them. They get the submarine coming in here, and one sub one sub chaser would lay this pattern, and these two would lay a pattern this way, and they were much more effective in getting a submarine. Mostly, they were really effective when they combined this function with an airplane. An airplane would go out and identify the submarine. It would lead the sub chasers out there and the destroyers out there, and they were much more useful in in a uh, attacking submarines. <clears throat> but what I'd like to do is show you uh, what else they were used for. In this case, the nine submarines from Elizabeth City went to uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and they were all eventually all supposed to go into the uh, uh, Baltic Sea, but that was taken over by the Germans. So they went up and they joined the northern uh, Russian fleet. And they would escort the convoys from 
Iceland, into Archangel, and Murmansk. Um, this was pretty much empty all the way up here. There was no other towns, and mostly Archangel and Murmansk were iced in about half of the year. So it was pretty tough to get people, but they, they, that was one of the main thoroughfares for the Soviets to get Lindley's uh, function. <clears throat> but they were also used in amphibious operations. Uh, towards the later part of the war, uh, the Russians had moved into the eastern part of Germany, and so they decided to clean out the Germans that were up here. Uh, Germans were up here because of the, of the uh, mines, and they would use the uh, ore to build uh, uh, tanks, and they were uh, uh, different types of ores that were used up there, and so that's why the Germans occupied this area. So the Soviet Army moved up here, and the Soviet Navy, with the submarine chasers, and three of them were from Elizabeth City, uh, landed their Marines, they call them Naval Infantry, here in Kirkins and uh, Petsamo region, and blocked this area so the Germans could not escape by sea, and they had to go down and finally escape down, down here. Uh, so that was, uh, it was, uh, a very incredible operation. The whole operation got the Order of Lenin, but the submarine chasers specifically got the Order of Yushikov, and this was, you know, it was a pretty big thing back then for those people. <clears throat> they also came across uh, from the North Sea. They sailed down the rivers in, in the Soviet Union, put them on trains, and carried them down to the Black Sea, and they put them in here at Isk. They came down, they joined up with the Black Sea Fleet, and then they would make amphibious operations chasing the Germans out of Ozessa and the Ukraine. And uh, the Germans were eventually had to backpedal this way. <clears throat> the minesweepers had a tough road. All eight of them that were built here went over to England, except one that went into the Mediterranean. And they conducted mine sweeping operations, and mostly at the beginning of the war, they, they cleared what they called the war channel. And the war channel was a swept area around the coast of England where all the, uh, uh, the movement of ships bringing uh, supplies into England was conducted. But they also started staging for the invasion of D-Day at all these places along the coast. And every one of these little ports had hundreds of ships getting ready. And there were probably about 5,000 ships involved in the D-Day landing. So on the given morning, they all got together and they sailed down here and they got into point Z. And they all collected themselves and they went down the swept channels and made the landing on the five beaches in Normandy. <clears throat> Every one of these paths going into here was led by one of the minesweepers from Elizabeth City, or from, from New Bern. Had three mine, different minesweeping methods, and depending upon, uh, I started out the war with this type, which was uh, basically just against uh, moored mines. The mine would be anchored into the seabed and then a ship would come along and he'd strike it. Well, they, they would use this function right here. It was called a paravane. The Navy, U.S. Navy called it paravane. The <laughs> British Navy called it an ore piece of float. And what it was, essentially nothing more than a trawl rig that fishermen would use. And the kite would hold the wire down, and the otter would hold the wire down, and the paravane would hold the, the uh, wire away from the side of the ship. And they had cutters on this wire, and as it, in, as it contacted the mine, these cutters would cut the mine, it would float to the surface, and then the mine would be sunk by rifle fire or machine gun fire. <clears throat> Later on, the Germans got wise, and they started putting magnetic uh, triggers on the mines, so then when a ship came along and it passed over this mine, the magnetic signature of the ship would cause the mine to detonate, so they would wrap a uh, steel cable and uh, copper cables around the ship, 
and changed the magnetic signature, and that was able to stop him. But the, to sweep these type of wines, the uh, minesweeper would tow an electric wire behind the ship and periodically would send a charge through there, which would allow the, the mine to receive that signal, and it would cause the mine to blow up. Now, the Germans got wise to that, so they started putting sound uh, receivers on their mines. And they had acoustic mines, so when a ship would sh start moving by, it would pick up the signature of the ship's propellers, and it would blow the ship as it passed over. Uh, so the, the, uh, the mine sweeping forces got a sound machine, which would send out a false signal to the uh, mines and allow them to be blown up before the ship got to them. All but two of the minesweepers from New Bern participated in clearing the river Scheldt into Antwerp. From the landings, the Canadians and the British came, and one of their jobs was to seize the town of Antwerp. Uh, and then they went on to a bridge too far, but <clears throat> basically they tried to get Antwerp to open up the ports. Now, there were other ports, uh, Ostend and Le Bruges and... Uh, um, uh, Le Havre, they were being opened up, but uh, they weren't very big ports. The prize was uh, Antwerp because it had so many cranes and so many piers and had a railway line to get supplies inland. But to clear it, they had to clear the minefields all the way up the River Scheldt. This was 90 miles to get to Antwerp. The Germans held Washington Island, they held uh, Beverland, this area, they held all of this area here. So while the ground troops came in, Canadians here, uh, the British, a couple of the Americans later on down here, uh, cleared this area. Uh, the commandos came in, hit the island, started moving down this way. Uh, they tried to sweep it before the, uh, before the islands were taken, but these were all covered by artillery, and they couldn't get, the minesweepers couldn't get through. So as the, as the area was cleared, they moved the minesweepers down and cleared the river all the way into Antwerp, and then were followed by the salvage ships, which had to clear the port of uh, Antwerp from sunken ships that the Germans had, uh, had sunk there. This is what the minesweeping formation looked like. The first uh, row would just be small boats that were dragging hooks and trying to connect, uh, connect up with, wine, with mines or anything that was in the river to tr make sure it was clear. And then a you know, ASDIC, which is forerunner of sonar, this boat would come along and try to identify wrecks and things. And then the first wave of minesweepers would come in. And these were the smaller mine, uh, minesweepers. And they were, they were towing the paravanes. And you can see how they just cleared the whole area. And then the, uh, uh, a minesweeper would come along with an electric uh, um, sweep to try and pick up anything these guys had missed. And the dan layers would come in, and the dan layers would lay buoys all along here. And they would set where the swept area was. And they would also follow the mine sweepers, and they would shoot any of the mines that were brought to the surface. And then the larger mine sweepers came in. These were the uh, BYMSs, the yard mine sweepers that were built in uh, uh, Newburn. And they would have both the paravanes and they would have also have the electric and uh, uh, the acoustic uh, minesweepers coming through. And again, they would sweep up the area until they got the whole thing. The, um, then the final one was a group of minesweepers. And these were the same size as these, the original ones up here. And they would tow a uh, electric and uh, uh, acoustic sweeps. And hopefully, by that time, you've cleared your mind and all the uh, merchant ships were able to come through. The net tenders or net layers, uh, the British called them boom defense ve uh, vessels. The U.S. Navy called them net tenders. Uh, and they would set up uh, anti-submarine and anti-torpedo nets across entranceways. Uh, they would look like this. They would have... Um, These were anchors, big, huge cement anchors. These were wires, wire rings 
and these were floats. And they would set these up across channels, across entranceways to harbors. They had one up across uh, Norfolk. Uh, and you can see these were big, huge nets. These were the floats. There was one guy down there. These floats had to be carried around. And they would be lifted by the prong bows of the net tenders. And to show you how it was used in war, this was out in the Western Pacific in the preparation for the invasion of Okinawa. There was a couple islands out here, Karama Reto, and these were seized prior to the Okinawa. And the Navy used it for a staging area. They had a, a naval anchorage where the ships would come in, rearm, refuel, refurbish, and then go back out, and they keep going back out to uh, get ready for the invasion. They put a seaplane landing area in here, and they put anti-submarine nets here, here, and here. And so that's how you would use a submarine net to protect an area. During the war from the North Carolina, we lost four vessels. Boston Salver was a uh, uh, salvage ship, and it was destroyed by a V-2 rocket. V-2 rocket uh, fired uh, on the town of Antwerp, landed right on top of it, and it was uh, um, pretty much completely destroyed. The submarine chaser 709 was heading north up to uh, Newfoundland and was going to do uh, patrol work up there, and she got caught in an ice storm, got completely covered with ice, uh, froze up the, her uh, rudder, froze up her engines, and she got washed onto the rocks off of Newfoundland. Uh, after the southern part of France had been cleared and the ports had been taken, a lot of the vessels from uh, the U.S. Navy were turned over and created a new French Navy. Uh, SC-638 from uh, Elizabeth City became the CH-116 for the French, and she was used as a minesweeper, and she was, she was lost, hit, hit by a mine while she was clearing. And then BYMS-2030 was struck by a mine while clearing the port of Le Havre. So by and large, of all the vessels we put out, uh, we were in pretty much good shape. But if you add all this stuff up, it was a pretty big contribution for the war effort. Now, this didn't happen this way, but it could have. It was very similar to what was going on. So if you were a young man from North Carolina, you either went in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, or the Coast Guard. If you went in the Army, uh, you went down to Fort Bragg. If you went in the Marines, you went down to Camp Lejeune. Uh, you embarked with your unit on a Navy assault transport ship. This was built in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, the troop ship was moved away from the pier in uh, Wilmington or Moorhead City uh, by U.S. Navy Tug, which was built in Elizabeth City. You sailed across the Atlantic in convoy escort by Navy submarine chasers, also built in Elizabeth City, and you uh, unit staged for D-Day in one of the various harbors in England, and you went in there uh, through a uh, submarine net, anti-submarine net, defended by a net tender built in Elizabeth City or in New Bern. On D-Day, you got back in your transport, and you sailed normally, and you went through channels swept by all but two of the, uh, the, the uh, minesweepers from Elizabeth City. Off Omaha Beach, you can sign the sides of the troop ship on cargo nets made in Wanchis. When guys didn't have any other work to do, they made cargo nets and they sent them up to uh, Manio, and they sold them to the government uh, for use in, in troop ships. Uh, you got into a landing craft built in Manio. Your landing craft was escorted to the beach by a submarine chaser built in Elizabeth City, and the U.S. Navy ensign who was in charge of that submarine chaser learned how to sail and learned how to be a Navy officer in a sailing boat that was built in Manio. Uh, when the port of An Antwerp was secured by the minesweepers from Newburn, uh, the port was cleared 
from sunken ships and sunken mines by Boston Salver until she was uh, hit. And then uh, <clears throat> American Salver came in, also built in uh, New Bern to uh, replace her. Uh, if your ship happened to get sunk, you climb down the net into a, uh, a life raft made in Manio, and you were rescued by an air-sea rescue boat built in Manio. So the whole operation was interwoven, it was combined together, and uh, pretty much uh, contributed a major effort. Now, this wasn't the only people doing this. All these functions were being carried out all over the United States by small boat yards and shipyards. Are there any questions? Thank you. Yes. Did, did they use plywood on some of these boats? Yes, they did. Um, in fact, some of the plywood was made down in uh, Hyde County. There was a company down there that did nothing but build plywood. And they shipped that all over the United States. It was marine grade waterproof. Yeah. Um, but all, all of these boats, except for the, uh, the air sea rescue boats, were made out of uh, planked, planked wood. The bigger boats, uh, the submarine chasers and the minesweepers and salvage ships, those were all uh, 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 planked uh, vessels. Those were Yes, that's what some of the RC rescue boats used uh, plywood. <clears throat> I was wondering about some of the wooden submarine chasers. Um, I read a lot about where they were sweeping for submarines and dropping lots of depth charges off the outer banks during World War II. And uh, they often would break large parts of the uh, destroyers and uh, Coast Guard cutters because the mines, I mean, the uh, depth charges would put that much pressure on the ship. How did the wooden submarine chasers? Depends on co how close you were. Right. Uh, that was part of the skill of the submarine chaser's captain to know how fast he had to be going to get away from his own depth charges. Right. Because did they? Sh were they more easily damaged by the depth charges, or did the wood absorb any more than? I, did on the steel ships. I, I don't really know. I, I can't say that. It's all dependent on how close you were to the bomb. Uh, and uh, in a lot of cases, um, prior to the submarine chasers being built, the Coast Guard would use any boat it had to patrol up and down the coast. Uh, they call it the hooligan fleet. And you'd get a lot of sailing ships. And they would get a machine gun and a radio, and they would go on down, look for... Uh, submarines. Uh, they tried to use depth charge on those guys, but they weren't fast enough to get away from them. So uh, they would, <clears throat> that, that idea didn't last very long. Um, so I was wondering, are some of these old historic shipyards still around, or have they been redeveloped or abandoned? Uh, most of them, um, all of the shipyards in Little City, the one in Washington, shut down immediately after the war. Uh, New Bern shut down its big production uh, capabilities, but it stayed open as a shipyard until about 1993. And you can go down there now. It's just uh, southeast of the area where uh, uh, Tryon Palace is. Uh, there's a, uh, a maritime museum there, or marine museum. Uh, that's where the shipyard was located. But it was closed down in 93. Uh, the <clears throat> Elizabeth City Shipyard closed down. It again, it just quit making large type thing. Went back to doing what it did before the war, but it stayed in existence till about 1973, and it's still there. But it's not. Uh, it does minor repair for stuff for boats coming in, but it's not a big operation right now. <clears throat> and the Manio um, uh, boat company. Again, it went back to doing what it did before the war, but it burned down uh, in the 50s. Uh, and all the stuff right now is if you go out to Manio, you see the uh, little maritime museum. Uh, that was part of it, and uh, that's the area that it was in. <clears throat> Weren't all the Liberty ships made out of steel? Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, but they were not 
they were good ships, but they were only built for the war. So all these LSTs, they built 1,000 LSTs, and they built uh, just 394 Liberty ships here in, in uh, Wilmington. So they built thousands of these uh, freighters. After the war, they had no use for them anymore, so they sold most of them off. But a lot of them, after being ridden for four years, uh, were in pretty bad shape. And so a lot of them just uh, were sold for scrap. I think there's only one remaining on the East Coast, the John Brown. She takes people out periodically. Yeah, there's, there's also one on the West Coast, the O'Brien, but there's the only two left of the Liberty ships. Uh, yeah, and there's a few LSTs left around. Uh, one in Indiana and one down in New Orleans. <clears throat> uh, there were most of the submarine chasers after the war, they were ridden so bad. I mean, they were hard used boats. Uh, they weren't really good much for anything, but they were sold to uh, uh, private people. We, some were converted into yachts. Uh, a lot were given to uh, Boy Scout troops and Sea Scouts and Girl Scouts to be used to learn how to uh, sail. Uh, and they lasted for quite a while. Uh, but there are not very many of those still around. Uh, there are a few, but not very many. I think Clark Abel's private yacht was a converted uh, sub chaser. Well, that, that could be John Wayne's private yacht was a minesweeper, yeah. just like the ones built here. Uh, so a lot of them were used for a lot. The um, uh, Jacques Cousteau's boat, Calypso, that John Denver made the song about, that was one of the BYMS minesweepers. Uh, that was built in the, in the U.S. <clears throat> were any of these diesel powered? Some were, yeah. Again, depending on what engines were available, it took a long time to generate all these boat engines. So a lot of companies were making gasoline engines, some were making diesel. And so whatever the Navy had would deliver to the, to the boat, and it would either be a diesel or a gasoline engine. <clears throat> A lot, all of the, uh, a lot of these wooden boats were just simply burned after the war. Uh, a lot of the Coast Guard picket boats that they used, the 38 foot that patrolled the entire coastline of the United States, were not much good for anything. They were expensive to run. Uh, they had been used hard. So basically, they just ran them up ground at high tide and burned them. Uh, the Soviets uh, kept a lot of uh, the minesweepers, or the uh, submarine chasers, and there was a big issue about turning these things back after the war because of the Cold War problems going on. <clears throat> but the Navy didn't want them back. They were, they were getting beat up, so the Russians just burned them. They took off the guns and the engines and just burned them all. My name is uh, Quentin Bell, and uh, this is a comment my father worked in the Sanders shipyard in Elizabeth City when I was a boy, and he always said he helped build sub chasers. So this was quite an uh, enlightenment for me, and thank you very much. The, uh, it was really interesting walking around the area uh, during the time because the, the workmen were so good at building the submarine chasers. They had these guys that were caulking the seams and they would do it in unison. And then they learned how to make music while doing it. So you could hear the various workmen, depending on how good they were, and they would start making music while they were caulking the sides of the engine. It got to be a, a pretty, pretty good thing for around there. Uh, but they used everybody. They used uh, uh, electricians. They used uh, plumbers. They used uh, all kinds of machinists. Uh, they used painters. They used uh, uh, supply admin people. Uh, they used welders. I mean, if, if you had a, were a trade and were pretty skilled in it, you were easy to get a job at one of these boatyards or shipyards. And if you didn't know anything about ships, you learned in a hurry. Were women part of the workforce? They had uh, uh, some, not here in Elizabeth City, except for the administration people. Those were women. But they had a lot of uh, women working down in Wilmington at the shipyard down there. And they were the Rosie the River, so they had a lot down there. Uh, but here in Elizabeth City, we didn't have that many. 
Were any of the shipyards integrated? Like, did they have African-American workers as well? They were in Elizabeth City. Uh, a lot of the skilled uh, laborers were uh, African-Americans here in Elizabeth City. They were integrated down in Wilmington. Uh, and there was, there was afraid there was going to be a big problem with it because they had a lot of problems with integrating the shipyards up in Norfolk. Uh, but they, they worked it all out down in Wilmington, and, yeah, they were pretty much integrated. No, because uh, Wilmington closed down. Uh, most of these shipyards just closed down. So it was kind of tough for a lot of people to get work after the war. But they had learned to trade uh, working in the shipyards, so they were able to, to transfer that to other jobs. A lot of the women who had jobs, when the men came back from the war, got kicked out, uh, even though they'd done done the same job and done the same work. Uh, the men came back looking for work, and so the women went back to what they did before the war. <clears throat> My mother uh, in uh, the war, she made bomb sites at a, a factory in Ohio, the Norden bomb site. She would put these things together, uh, but that closed down after the war, so she went back to being a teacher. Well, thank you all for coming, and again, thank you, Mr. Converse, for uh, your great talk tonight. Well, thank you for, for that. <clears throat>